Well, you should expect that I will be able to talk to you about warm and humans. That's what I do. I'm a physician. I work at Fort Hood. I take care of soldiers who go out and with 50 or 60 or 80 pounds of gear run around in the summer in the middle of Texas. So I know a little bit about heat illness and I want to talk to you today about climate change catastrophe that's being predicted by the World Health Organization and the UN. It's nonsense. They are already proven to be stupid with regards to their predictions. They said there would be 10 million displaced persons by the year 2010, 2010. Think about that. So what were they trying to say? They were trying to say this is a terrible thing. It's going to destroy the human race or at least deplete it significantly. And what, did, what happened last week? Last week, the president and the EPA, in concert, said, if we don't control carbon dioxide, which they now call carbon pollution, 5,000 people a year are going to have premature deaths, and 150,000 kids are going to have asthma attacks who shouldn't be having asthma attacks. Neither one of those claims are true. And I'll tell you why in my short talk. First of all, uh, this is the printout of Chapter 7, CCR2, Biological Effects, Human Effects. And the uh, title of the chapter is Human Health. The chapter in the earlier editions of the book were Chapters 9, Chapters 9 in the first and the second. Chapter 9 was not nearly as good as this. This is an 80-page, extraordinarily well-referenced chapter on human health. And it goes through all of the factors that need to be considered if you're going to study the question of whether warming will produce any significant human health deleterious effects. So let's talk about it. The rule is, Warm is good for people who run around at a temperature of 98.6 oral, 99.6 rectal. 75 degrees is about right for old people. 72 is young people can tolerate cooler a little bit better than older people. So 75 degrees for somebody like me who likes to wear socks when he goes to bed is something that you need to think about as something related to the question of how your circulation is. So the human health chapter, which I'm sure it has the tracks of uh, Craig Itso, uh, and Craig is a PhD, so there are a couple of things that I thought may have been said better or differently, but the, the, the chapter is an extraordinarily good chapter on the question of how warming might affect human health. And in, in the net, the net effect is going to be that warming, if it did occur, we've got all kinds of lectures that you've already listened to that say probably not going to occur the way that they say it would. If it did occur, even to the degree that they say is going to be catastrophic, nonsense. It means that fewer people are going to die, more people are going to live to an older and more comfortable age, there are going to be fewer problems with certain kinds of diseases. Here's the way it works. More people die in the winter than in the summer. Around the world, up and down, in and out, 10% or more difference. 10% more people die in the winter than in the summer. Cardiovascular diseases are the main killers of people who are older. So the reason that people live more or live better in a warmer climate, the reason that old people move to warmer climates is it reduces their circulatory problems. Cold tends to make the blood vessels contract and the blood sludges. Sludging blood causes heart attacks and strokes. It also causes circulatory problems 
that can affect solid organs and organs like the lungs, which are not solid but have a lot of blood vessels in them. And so as a result, warm is good for you. Warm will make you live longer. If you have a choice between living in Canada, you know, Mr. Mo Dr. Michaels was talking about it today, or Dr. Moore was talking about it today. If you have a choice between living in Canada and living in a warmer climate, take the warmer climate if you're getting older. So cardiovascular diseases are definitely uh, less of a factor in your life and would be less likely to cause you trouble at an early or premature age if you move to a warmer climate or live in a warmer climate. Same is true of respiratory illnesses, both infectious and otherwise. We already talked about stroke because the, the cardiovascular factor is, is there. And uh, Dr. Lowley uh, talked a significant, uh, a significant amount of his time on infectious disease and vector diseases. All of the vector diseases are not impacted of any, in any significant way by a change in climate of two or even four degrees. Mosquitoes were endemic to Finland. The last big malaria epidemic was in St. Petersburg. Do I have to say anything more? Have you, ever, have you ever gone to Minnesota? They have mosquitoes in Minnesota that are bigger than helicopters. They will carry you away. <laughs> so mosquitoes don't have any problem living in a cool climate. They just hibernate. Or maybe they just die and leave their eggs so that there will be new mosquitoes the next year. I'm not an entomologist, so I can't tell you that. But the fact is that they don't, they're not around during the winter but they're plenty around in the summertime, even in the high latitudes. As far as tick-borne diseases, there isn't any reason that a tick can't walk a little farther north or a little farther south. So don't worry about the ticks. They're not going to be affected. Dengue fever is the one that everybody talks about as being something that would be increased by a warmer climate. Well, dengue is mostly about hygiene. It's, it's carried by Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti is one of the mosquitoes that's notorious. Anopheles mosquitoes are the ones that carry malaria. Malaria is a, uh, is a protozoal disease that infects the blood cells and causes tremendous troubles, killed so many people. There's absolutely no excuse for what William Rickles, Ruckles House did when he was head of the EPA. Millions of children died terrible deaths because of William Ruckel's house. And he's testifying in Congress last month, talking about how the EPA really is a great organization. Well, that's the, uh, the, the most important stuff with regards to warm. I could say more, but I don't think I need to. Let's talk about the EPA, and let's talk about the new plans. Cutting carbon pollution from power plants, the clean power plan overview, fact sheet, EPA, will save 6,000 lives, give or take, and will prevent 150,000 asthma attacks, give or take. That's based on science that has nothing to do with climate, nothing to do with this conference. But I insist on talking about it because, as Mark Morano said in one of the other panels, they've conflated the death numbers and the disease numbers into their climate campaign. And I need to, I need to get you to understand how this has happened. Epidemiology is the study of populations. It's a very loosey-goosey discipline. There's no way to control the confounders. The counts are always unreliable, and there's lots of trouble with just plain observational ecological studies. That's what the EPA uses to determine how many deaths they're going to claim are caused by various forms of air pollution. Most of the criteria air pollutants do not kill anybody. The ozone, ozone precursors, carbon monoxide, those elements of the, of the criteria pollutants don't kill anybody. The focus of the EPA is small particles. 
fine dust is what Mark Morano says we should call it because everybody kind of goes, ooh, small particles. It's 2.5 micron, micron size particles. And the theory that the EPA has is it can get really way down into your lungs. Only they can't show me one dead person from small particles. And here's what's happened. They've invented a new form of death. It's called premature death. And what it means is it's a, it's a trick. Let's take a population of 100,000 people. Maybe 57 people average every day die in this population, this statistical regional group. So, but they don't die 57 every day. They die 58, 59, 60, 30, 70. So there's a big variation in the rate of death day to day. And they start monitoring the air pollution. Okay? Are you getting to the point where you know where I'm going? They're looking for an association. And they're calling premature deaths, deaths on the day that it happens to be above the average deaths for that particular population. They aren't even people who should live longer. If you're 90 years old and you die on a day when the numbers are higher than the average, you get tallied as a premature death. Last year, Lisa Jackson, who was administrator of the EPA, testified to the Congress that the small, the small particle pollution deaths in the United States were as much as 500,000, as much as the number of people who died from cancer. And if we could just fix those deaths. But they're not deaths at all, are they? They took a part of those deaths and attributed it to the fact they were going to close down some plants with these new regulations. That's where that number comes from. The second thing is ozone and asthma. The EPA has tried for 20 years to prove that asthma, that asthma is caused by ozone, and they can't do it. Ozone is not a toxic air pollutant. It doesn't cause disease, doesn't kill anybody. Remember that. I think that's good enough for me today.